Hi everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERDEP and ESCCP webinar series. My name is Jennifer Nyman. I'm a principal at Geosyntech Consultants, and I'm the moderator of today's webinar. The webinar today will consist of a brief overview of CERDEP and ESTCP by Dr. Herb Nelson. Then, Dan Brown will present on today's topic, Sediment Volume Search Sonar. He will pause in the middle of his presentation for a brief question and answer session, and we will conclude today's webinar with a final Q&A session. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the chat box on the lower left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period, though, to submit your questions. And in fact, we encourage you to submit questions in advance of that session. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in case you experience difficulties with the broadcast audio. Typically, any delay will be fixed if you refresh your screen or call into the conference line. However, if you continue to have problems, please do submit a comment in the lower left-hand portion of your, of your screen using that chat box. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Herb Nelson, who has been serving as the CERDIP and ESTCP Program Manager for Munitions Response since 2007. In addition, Herb is the Executive Director of CERDIP and ESTCP. Prior to joining CERDIP and ESTCP, Herb was a research chemist at the Naval Research Lab in Washington, where his work focused on the detection and classification of buried UXO. Herb? Thank you, Jennifer, and uh, good morning to everyone. I know it's a few minutes past noon on the East Coast, but I'm in Denver today, so it's still morning to me. So, Jennifer, we have the next slide, please. So I think uh, this introduction will be familiar to many of you, but to those that are just learning about us, we have a real quick rundown of our two programs. The Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, which was established by Congress in 1991, is a DOD, DOE, and EPA partnership. In uh, the words of the Department of Defense, CERDIP is a uh, 6.1 to 6.3 program. That means advanced uh, technology on the uh, the uh, development side, all the way back to basic research on the research side. And we really try to focus on high priority environmental needs of the Department of Defense. The companion program on the second, the next slide is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. And this is, uh, was created by DOD alone in the middle 90s to try to bridge what's uh, often called the valley of death where we'd come to the end of a CERTA program with the technology, have very good results, but it would end up in a nice report on somebody's shelf. So this is really to transition technology out of the lab, uh, promote implementation by doing demonstrations on bases, interact with regulators. The subject of today's pr uh, presentation, though, however, is a CERTA program, so that we're uh, back in the development stages. So we go to the next slide, please. So the two programs, CERTA and ESDCP, we manage ourselves and we manage projects in five program areas. Environmental restoration, which is uh, I think of as traditional chemical cleanup. Insulation, energy, and water, which is uh, you know obvious what that is. Munitions response, which of course is the topic of today's webinar. Resource conservation and resiliency, which uh, focuses on both the built and natural infrastructure uh, owned and managed by the department. And then finally, weapon systems and platforms, which is a very broad area covers everything from weapon systems as it does to all sorts of things in the defense industrial base. So on the next slide, we will see a little detail on the munitions response area. We spent a lot of energy in the 90s and the first decade of this century working on munitions on land, ending up with classification, or what's often these days called advanced classification. We've really, since the, in the last seven or eight years, focused almost exclusively on missions at munitions in the underwater environment. And we really look at it in several ways. Uh, surveys, either wide area to, uh, for footprint reduction or detailed surveys for individual item protection. Once we find them then, we clearly have to know something about cost-effective recovery and disposal, which can be difficult in many environments, maybe even that one at the bottom right where it's all with 
and coral and things. And then since we will manage many of these munitions, underwater munition sites in place, we've got a big effort on uh, characteristics of munitions underwater, including their burial and mobility. The topic of today's uh, webinar, obviously, it falls under the uh, wide area detailed surveys. And as Dan will show you in a minute or two, really focuses on the shallow end, which is where we have a big problem. On the next slide, we give the response. We give the excuse me a list of the upcoming webinars for the uh, rest of the calendar year. You can see we rotate among the various divisions, uh, the various program areas. I don't know. I said division. Sorry about that. Uh, so for any of these that look appealing to you, the details of how to register. You should follow the same thing you did to register for this talk, but the details are on the next slide. You go to our uh, home page, find the Training and Tools tab, and then obviously in webinars you can register. And then the next slide reminds you that we also this year uh, have started, we were able last year after a long hiatus, we were able to start back up the CERT and ESCC Symposium. We have it again this year. It will be the same, our traditional week, which is the week after Thanksgiving this year. Those dates are November the 27th to the 29th. It will be at the Washington Hilton again, which is where it was last year. We also have the uh, approval package in for the 2019 symposium. I think it's sailing through its signatures, although it's amazing how many people have to sign that piece of paper before we can have it. So we hope to be able to announce at the 2018 symposium the details of the 2019 symposium. So now we can, uh, having dispensed with the overview of the site, of, of the programs, and giving you some stuff, we can get on to what you really came to hear. And I'll turn it back over to Jennifer to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Herb. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Daniel Brown, who is a research and development engineer at the Applied Research Laboratory at the Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Brown's research interests include synthetic aperture sonar signal processing, sonar system performance modeling, acoustic navigation, and coherence of scattering from random rust surfaces. Prior to working at the Applied Research Laboratory, he was a scientist in the Naval Surface Warfare Center in Panama City, Florida. While at the Naval Surface Warfare Center, he was the co-recipient of the Navy's Scientist and Engineer of the Year Award in 2007 for his work on the first demonstration of embedded real-time signal processing for synthetic aperture sonar systems. Dr. Brown received his doctoral degree in acoustics from the Pennsylvania State University. Dan? Thanks for the uh, introduction, Jennifer. And uh, we'd also like to thank Sertip and Herb for the support of the Sediment Volume Search Sonar Project. Um, to look at an agenda of what we're going to talk about today, I I'm going to start by trying to give an overview of what we see as the problem statement and then an overview of the program that we have to address that problem. We're going to spend a little bit of time moving on into fundamentals of sonar imaging. This is at a very high level just to try and give people a, a general conceptual idea of how sonar imaging is done and how it can be applied to this problem. And then we'll talk about some work that we've done on modeling the performance of the sensor. So, so early in the program, we went through a modeling and sim phase, and we'll brief out what, what some of our results there were. Uh, after that portion, we're going to have a Q&A session, the first Q&A session. And, and what I'd like is um, if we can keep the questions that are asked in that first Q&A session kind of focused towards the results of modeling, either the problem statement or the modeling of the sonar system performance. After that Q&A session, we're going to get into talking about um, initial results from a prototype demonstration that we conducted last year. So moving beyond the modeling and sim, we, we built the system and took it to the field and collected some data. And then at the end, we'll have Q&A session number two where, where everything's on the table. Feel free to ask about the, the sonar, the data, the modeling, anything you want there. So moving on to try and state what we, what we think the problem is. Shallow water UXO or unexploded ordnance munitions is a real challenging area for CERTA. And, and as we've looked at the problem and understand it, the way we see it is there's a capability gap that exists to conduct the detailed surveys that Herb was talking about in very shallow water depths. And so to put numbers to what we mean by very shallow water, we're thinking water depths less than five meters, really in this kind of one to five meter depth range. And, and trying to address that problem is important for a pair of reasons. 
Um, one, many of the uh, many of the environmental restoration sites that the DoD needs to worry about have uh, have water depths that m may contain contamination uh, that that are shallow like this. So so there's a a very large number of sites at these depths, and two. That's really the place where the potential for human UXO interaction is high. You know, so in the, in the picture shown here to the right at Naval Air Station Patuxent River, we can see a UXO boundary called out here in red, so over in here. And we can see that even from this overhead kind of optical image, you can see the sandbars that are in there, right? So these, these water depths are, are quite shallow. And these are the places where people could walk into the water and actually potentially encounter a UXO. And so, so there's a lot of these sites that are important to address, but the current sensors and platforms that exist today really aren't well suited for conducting surveys in these waters. A number of the uh, acoustic systems that, that we've seen used for UXO survey are either based on off of unmanned underwater vehicles or, uh, or underwater robots or are towed systems and towing or operating a UUV in these really shallow water depths can be particularly challenging. And so we wanted to try and address this through, uh, through the um, design and demonstration of a new type of sensor. And so we, we call our sonar the Sediment Volume Search Sonar, or SVSS sensor. And the, the whole purpose of our program is design, demonstrate, a system capable of very shallow water buried UXO imaging. And so our platform is shown here on the right. Uh, in the top right figure, it's a pontoon boat where we have a, uh, an area in the forward portion of the boat with a sonar system mounted. So the sonar system is mounted here. And we can lower that sonar into the water and then conduct tests in areas where we've seeded, the fee seeded a field with, uh, with test objects. So you can see a solid aluminum cylinder there in the kind of leftmost image circled in red. And then we're going to create sonar imagery, like the image that's in blue at the bottom. And the red, the red kind of uh, shape there is calling out that, that solid aluminum cylinder. So, so our technology development is focused on the design of the surface craft and the sonar system that is mounted to that surface craft that's used to conduct these types of surveys. And then our development also then focuses on the associated signal processing. So how do you take that sonar data that you're going to collect and turn it into an image that can be reviewed either by a human or a machine to try and find these targets? Our current program progress is we've uh, recently, or last year, we completed a modeling and simulation effort that we've passed through, and we moved into a prototype demonstration phase, and that prototype field, that first set of prototype field experiments has been conducted as well. And really, those two bullets there at the bottom, that's kind of how we're breaking this, uh, that's kind of how we're breaking this presentation down. Leading up to the first Q&A session, we're going to focus on the model and sim, and then in the back half of the presentation, we'll talk about the field experiments. So the SVSS sensor um, must address four challenges that were, were laid out to us uh, by, by, uh, by CERTIP or identified by us and CERTIP together. One is we need to think about how to deal with something called multipath reverberation interference, and there will be some slides later that, that detail what that means. We needed to try and quantify the gains that our design creates compared to existing systems, both in terms of usability and in terms of uh, data fidelity. We needed to try and uh, address the challenges of platform motion. So how does the fact that our pontoon boat might be, might be uh, uh, um, operating on an air-water interface that has some waves and the, and the boat's moving around? And then finally, we need to talk about, understand how sediment proper, property variability can impact the, uh, impact the sonar system. And so to address these challenges, we laid out a three-phase technical approach. In phase one, we have a modeling and simulation effort that focused on taking some existing models that existed within our community and adapting those for the problem of buried UXO um, data generation so that we could generate synthetic sonar data. We then also focused on adapting an existing signal processing scheme to make it be able to generate this volumetric or three-dimensional imagery. 
And then given this, this leveraged modeling and SIM capability and this leveraged signal processing capability, we wanted to analyze and quantify expected system performance and get an idea of how well such a sensor might work. Moving out of the phase one effort and into phase two, we took an existing test platform and some existing sonar hardware, and we reconfigured it in order to conduct experiments for CERTIP and to try and answer these questions. We also modified the signal processing algorithms based upon the field data analysis and used this prototype system that really leveraged a lot of existing hardware in order to try and demonstrate performance for UXO detection. And really the goal of this phase was um, to a minimum cost to CERTIP, how can we get out in the field and, and show the, the potential utility of this type of system? Moving into phase three, we're now considering a purpose-built hardware design based upon the lessons learned in phases one and two. We always are gonna be further refining our signal processing and data visualization and then continuing to demonstrate performance for UXO detection. The talk today is really gonna focus on the phase one effort and the phase two effort, the two efforts that, we're, that we've uh, completed, and we're just now beginning phase three right now, so we're moving into that phase of the program, and that, that really won't be briefed in this talk. Okay, so let's talk about the concept of what this sonar system is and how it works, and this, this is gonna be at quite a high level. Um, so the SPSS is a two-dimensional synthetic aperture sonar, that is the the synthetic aperture that we generate um, is, is two-dimensional in nature. It's like a planar array. And that type of sonar system can generate 3D imagery in shallow water. So that allows us to generate imagery that has voxels so that we can look kind of into the lake bed or the seabed to try and find objects. This type of sonar uses synthetic aperture sonar, SAS signal processing, and that type of signal processing allows us to generate very high resolution imagery within the seafloor. And so on the following slides, I'm gonna try and give just a basic overview of the concepts of sonar imaging and how those apply to the problem that, uh, that we're trying to address with the SVSS sensor. So, here in this figure, we're, we're gonna talk about a type of sonar called a real aperture sonar as opposed to a synthetic aperture sonar, but the general concepts are very similar and instructive. So the acoustic images that we're going to form are spatial maps of acoustic scattering intensity. And so what that means here is in this little figure, we have a vehicle that might be traveling through the water and it sends sound out to the right along this line, and it sends sound out to the left along these lines. And as those echoes come back off the bottom, the echo strength is proportional to the um, strength of scattering from the bottom. And so in this little cartoony example, we've got this sand area here, and that's producing an image that's this kind of um, gray color here. And we've got a pile of gravel so these objects scatter sound more effectively than sand. And so consequently in the image, the associated gravel shows up as bright. So in our acoustic imaging concept, we're mapping echo strength to brightness in the image. That is things that look brighter scatter more effectively and they give us some, in, some um, notion of the geometry of the scatterer. And so in this case over here, there's a big boulder and that boulder scatters very well, so it's very bright. There's a little mud patch here. The mud doesn't scatter so well, so it shows up dark. Okay, so the map resolution is determined by the range and transducer size and the frequency. So you design your hardware in order to generate some resolution in the image that you want, and the pixel values that are in that image are proportional to scattering intensity. So the brighter an object appears in the image, the more strongly it's scattering the sound. And so this is how an acoustic image is formed, and this is the type of, the type of um, interpretation you can use when you see later images that I'm gonna show from this sensor. So just to emphasize this a little bit more, we imagine we have a sonar system here on the left, shown in white, and it's going to transit down the screen in this track 
and it's going to be sending sound out to the right. And there's 12 objects here. And we can scatter sound off of each of those objects. And so if I advance the sonar a little bit, now this sonar is lined up with these four points. And in our image that comes out, we get one, two, three, four echoes. Right? And so the strength of those echoes, they're brighter, which that shows you visibly where the, where the objects are and where they're scattering from. And so as we continue to advance the sonar down the screen, we can see the next four objects, the next four objects, and we keep on moving along. And so in forming this image that's on the right, really all we're plotting is the strength of the scattered energy, the strength of the echoes that are coming back from our sonar system. And so the color is proportional to that strength, and the along track resolution in this case is degrading with range because we're using a real aperture sonar system. So to improve image, to improve sensor resolution, um, we, or by improving the sensor's resolution, we improve the image quality and interpretability. So on the left, we're showing a sensor that has a wide beam width and a low bandwidth, and that produces a very um, blurry image that's quite difficult to tell what the object is on the sea floor. And then in the middle one, we've narrowed the beam width, which improves our along track resolution, but we still have low bandwidth. And we can see, well, we're starting to make out what the object is a little bit more, but it's still kind of blurry in one direction. And finally, in the third image on the right, we have a narrow beam width and a high bandwidth, and we have a very highly resolved image. So we can see the Penn State logo now on the sea floor in this image. So higher resolution imagery allows people, um, operators or, or data reviewers, to detect smaller objects or target features. So the higher you can make the resolution of your image, the more detail you can pull out to try and understand and put context to the objects that you're looking at. And so one technique that you can use, one, one fairly sophisticated signal processing technique you can use to achieve high resolution imagery is a technique called synthetic aperture processing. And so what synthetic aperture processing does is it allows you to, um, through, some, through some signal processing techniques, it allows you to create virtual um, sonar arrays that are much, much larger than the type of arrays that you can practically build physically. And so by building up very, very large virtual sonar systems, we can generate very high resolution imagery. And so in this example, a ping from a single real sonar at this position here might have degrading resolution with range. This intersection of this footprint grows with range, and so that indicates that we're going to lose resolution. But by synthetically combining a number of these transmissions along this line together, we can generate the synthetic aperture footprint that's range invariant and quite high resolution. And so there's a sophisticated signal processing approach that allows us to move beyond the limits of what we can physically build in hardware to realize imagery that can be that's generated from very large virtual sonar arrays. And that's one of the things that the, that the sediment volume search sonar is exploiting. So what does our array actually look like? I said a couple of slides ago that it's a two-dimensional synthetic aperture sonar array to generate three-dimensional imagery. So this is what a two-dimensional synthetic aperture sonar array might look like. We have transmitters shown in blue, shown in blue squares. So transmitters along this row, five of them here and one here, and then receivers shown in the little yellow squares here. We have 80 receivers in the array that we're using today. Now, in the actual operation of this sonar system, today we're not using this forward transmitter and we're not using the DVL, although they are included in the system if we need them. The sonar system today focuses on these five transmitters here. And so by using this array, which is pointed then at the seafloor, so in the plane of the page that you're looking at, that kind of rides along the surface of the water, so all of this is pointed down at the seafloor. 
we transmit a certain signal from each one of our transmitters sequentially, and we record the echoes that come back on our 80 receivers, and then we process all of that recorded data with this synthetic aperture sonar algorithm, and we generate high-resolution, three-dimensional imagery of the sub-bottom. And we use that to look for, to look for buried UXO. So this is what the array looks like mounted on our mounted on our pontoon boat. So you can see the array from the prior slide on the right. That array is mounted to what we call the array plate. It's this large black metal plate here. The five the five transmitters shown here are along this back row in here, and then these yellow cables each go to a group of eight receivers. So we have ten eight channel modules in our receive array. And then this whole thing is mounted in the front of the pontoon boat in this rectangular frame that we can lower into the water with this crane. And so it's a hand cranked crane. When it's time to test, we drive the boat to the test location and we lower the sonar system into the water and that, that array plate um, is lowered into the water so that the face of the array is below the bottom of our pontoons and then we're in testing mode and we can drive the boat around and collect data against the bottomed objects. Okay, so that's the concept of what the program is and what its objectives are. And that's the concept of what our hardware looks like. Let's talk about trying to model the performance of this system. So. In trying to model the performance of this system, our approach was to leverage a pair of existing models and adapt them to some specific nuances of the buried UXO problem. And so the goal is really at the end of the day to generate the figure on the right where we see a three-dimensional, uh, simulated three-dimensional buried UXO object. So we have an object here buried at one meter depth beneath the sediment water interface, and this image is showing three slices that, that pass, uh, pass through that data volume. And so we wanted to be able to generate synthetic sonar data that could be processed through a signal processing chain to generate the image on the right for a range of sediment types, object types, um, and, and target burial depths. The environmental model was developed by um, the Applied Research Lab at Penn State by the group here and it's called POSSUM, and so that environmental model calculates all of the energy that is scattered from, uh, from within the simulated volume except for that energy that comes from the target. So it's everything that's not the target comes through the environmental model. The target model was developed by uh, Aubrey Espana and Steve Cargill at the Applied Physics Laboratory at the University of Washington. The target model models everything that scatters from the target, um, but not the environment. And so by combining this environmental scattering model and this target scattering model together, the combined models are suitable to produce synthetic data that we could then analyze using our signal processing algorithms to try and understand, um, A, what are the correct signal processing approaches to generate this imagery, and B, um, how does the performance of the sensor vary as a function of the environment the target type, and the sonar hardware design. So we want to use this model to really kick the tires on potential designs and understand the pros and cons of the various approaches. So we'll start, with talk, we'll start by talking about the point-based sonar scattering model, or POSSUM as we call it. It's a model of models um, simulation approach. That is, it's, um, it's, a, it's a main larger model that has many sub-models to address different physical um, components of the system. It generates representative time series at the element level. So what we mean by that is um, each, each run of the simulation is a single transmitter and a single receiver, and the output is that we get um, calibrated pressure levels. So we, we generate a simulation of the scattering from an environment, and we get a plot of pressure versus time. What would the echo look like? And we validated this model, um, we validated this model to show that we are getting um, the correct 
mean field, mean square field, and also the, the correct uh, um, spatial and temporal coherence of the scattered field. So in this example shown here on the right, we can see we have five transmitters, the diamonds that lead this array. And so we're, we're firing from this diamond here. And then we have a portion of our receive array modeled. And this gray circle back here is the receiver that we're modeling. And so given that we transmit from here with some beam pattern and receive here from some beam pattern, we have a set of scatterers that are on the surface. So that's this kind of dark region here that looks kind of randomly sampled. So we have some randomly distributed scatterers on the surface, as well as a set of randomly distributed scatterers in the bottom. So randomly distributed scatterers in the sub-bottom of the lake or seabed. And then the color maps to the scattering level from each one of those scatterers. So in this case, you can almost visualize the beam pattern of the transmitter and the intersection of the beam pattern and the scattering strength here at the interface. So we use MATLAB for our primary development environment, but then those parts of the, uh, those parts of the model that have to be accelerated um, are accelerated using C++ and CUDA libraries and so the, the kind of the core engine of the model runs on graphics cards. So the scattered field is calculated for each of the individual points shown there on the left. We also have separate calculations where we split off the interface and volume scattering, the specular and diffuse scattering. And so this POSA model provides us with a really flexible way to generate coherent time series for the environmental scattering problem. And here on the bottom right, you can see a plot where we call out the individual components of a scattered field. So we have specular interface scattering, diffuse interface scattering, diffuse volume scattering, and then in purple, the combined envelope of all of them. And in this case, for very fine silt, which has low sediment attenuation and is fairly well impedance matched to water, we don't get a significant contribution from the interface. The primary contribution is from sub-bottom or volume scattering down in the, uh, down in the seabed. All right, so that covered the, um, the environmental model, so all the scattering that isn't from the target. So now let's talk about all the scattering that is from the target. This model is developed at the Applied Physics Laboratory at the University of Washington. Um, as I mentioned before, Aubrey Espana and Steve Cargill were our collaborators in working on this. Their model is called TIER, or the Target in the Environment Response Model. And so this model combines a finite element model of the free field scattering of axisymmetric targets. So for example, the, uh, the uh, 100 millimeter aluminum UXO shown here on the right would be modeled in finite element modeling in the free field in order to get an idea of, um, of the response of that object to, to an incoming wave and the field scattered from it. And then that's mated to a propagation model um, for proud targets that includes all the potential um, target local multipaths or all the different ray paths that can intersect with that target, or for buried targets, a propagation model that accounts for um, uh, transmission losses, um, refraction, attenuation at the sediment water boundary. And so the real work for, for APL in supporting us on this project the uh, SVSS sensor actually operates close enough to the seafloor that we have to consider bistatic ray paths as opposed to the traditional monostatic approach. So TIER was expanded to include these bistatic ray paths so that it was generating data suitable for analysis by, uh, by our signal processing tool chain. So given the combination of, of TIER and POSSUM, we're then able to generate simulations of buried targets. Um, another type of simulation that we ran were resolution target simulations. And, and this was really aimed at trying to quantify um, or address in a quantitative way one of the questions that CERTIP had asked us. That question was, you know, can you quantify the, the potential gains of your design over existing systems? And one of the unique aspects of our design is the five, transmitter, uh, five transmitters that are along the front of the array. And so we're using full coherent addition of those cross-tack transmitters 
And we believe it, it provides some gains, and those gains were quantified through these resolution target simulations. So here on the left, I am showing the results of a simulation where a single isolated point scatterer was at a range of three meters from the sonar system at zero meters cross track. So it's directly beneath the sonar system at three meters depth generated using only transmitter C. And this is a 2D projection of the data in the along track direction. And so this is what our sonar image might look like for that object here. On the right, we've merged all five transmitters together, coherently combined them together, and used the exact same target layout. So we again have a point scatterer located at three meters range from the sonar system along the center line, a cross track position of zero meters. Now, one way to think about this is in some sense, if, if you have a background in, in electrical engineering, or signal processing, and you've looked at filter design, this can be thought of as almost a 2D representation of the impulse response function of our system. And so you can look at this, and you can see a couple of advantages from the merged transmitter. One, you'll notice the width of the main lobe here is a bit narrower, and we'll look at quantifying that in a little bit but we're realizing almost a 50% improvement in resolution by merging the transmitters. So the coherent combination of multiple transmitters has a synthetic aperture-like effect that gives us some, some improvement in the system resolution. So our ability to then pick out um, details on targets or more accurately measure target dimensions, that's one advantage. Another advantage is you can see here a hard kind of cutoff where the result is all black, so there's no data written out in this portion, and the same kind of thing over here. Whereas we don't see that limitation for the merged transmitters. That has to do with the field of view of the acoustic projectors we're using. So by using multiple acoustic projectors, we can increase the field of view or increase the area covered by the sensor, so we're, we're able to cover more area or generate a larger set of imagery for any single pass of the sensor. That's another advantage. And finally, the, the most obvious visual, this obvious visual advantage looking at this is these are all side lobes, either time or azimuth side lobes. So this is all unwanted energy in here and in here. And we can see that that's greatly reduced through the coherent combination of these transmitters. So what happens is the side lobe structure doesn't coherently interfere um, as we merge multiple transmitters, and so we can reduce side lobe interference. And the result with that is we'll improve image contrast. That is, weak targets will stand out against the background better through this coherent combination. And so we're going to have a couple of slides that try and quantify these qualitative statements that I've just made over the next, next two slides, I believe. So I stated that the coherent combination of those transmitters improves the cross-track resolution. And we can see here, if you look at the difference between the purple line and the orange line here, the purple line is, um, is, is the cross-track resolution using only the centered transmitter. And we can see that that is quite a bit worse than the cross-track resolution measured using the merged transmitters. So then we're getting a gain of resolution. We're able to detect either smaller objects or on a larger object, smaller features of that object. So a higher resolution helps aid us in interpreting this imagery to find targets. Also, there's a way to quantify the um, reduction in side lobe level that I was calling out in the prior slide, where I was, where I was pointing to those areas where our side lobes are, are suppressed. The measure isn't particularly important for this presentation, but it's ISLR, the integrated side lobe ratio. And we can see, again, in orange compared to blue, lower is better um, for ISLR. And we can see by merging the transmitters, we get a gain in the integrated side lobe ratio. So that is, the, the system with merged transmitters will produce a higher contrast image that allows us to reject, tar reject environmental reverberation better. Finally, to try and understand what's the impact of, uh, of 
of environmental variability, using these simulations, we we're also do, able to investigate what happens if we have errors in sound speed or if the sub-bottom, if the sediment has a different sound speed than water. In the plot shown here, what we're showing is an equivalent simulation to the ideal point target simulation, except where the sediment sound speed was equivalent to that of sand, and the targets were buried at some depth. And we then use our signal processing algorithms. We seed them with the correct sound speed, and we see that we're able to recover the resolution. So that is, if you compare this plot to a plot two slides earlier, you would see the resolution is recovered through the signal processing chain. So we believe that environmental variability, if it can be, if it can be quantified, can be properly compensated for so we don't lose image resolution. So these point target simulations demonstrated the advantages of our multi-transmit design. It allows us to quantify the theoretical system resolution so we can ask questions of what's the smallest thing we can resolve. It allowed us to investigate the impact of environmental mismatch. And finally, and it was critical for this, we learned how to adapt our existing image formation algorithms to 3D signal processing through this work. What I've shown here is really just scratching the surface of, of the kind of breadth of the analysis that went on with these point targets. But I, I hope it gives you kind of a flavor of what the, what the work was. So now reaching back to the possum and tear combined model, we used the two system, the two modeling systems together to evaluate system performance across a range of environments. The sonar array that we simulated is a subset of what we went on to build in the prototype phase, but it's still, it's still a representative of our system. So again, we have five transmitters shown here, and we have a four by 12 receive array. We simulated operating in the 15 to 25 kilohertz operating band. We had three different target types that we simulated a large cylinder, a small cylinder, and a sphere. And those targets are, there's, those targets lengths and diameters are called out here in this table as well. And finally, we considered three different sediment types. We had a medium sand, which represented a, uh, a rough reflective sediment that has a relatively high attenuation coefficient. We had very fine silt that was a much easier sediment to operate in, so the, so the uh, impedance mismatch to water was lower and it has low attenuation. And finally, for some, just for some validation of our approach, we invented a new sediment that we called water sand, which has the same density as sand, but the same sound speed as water with no attenuation, right? So we, we have a hypothetical that we, used, uh, that we used for some testing as well. And so we were able to, we were able to evaluate the um, array design and transmitter designs across a range of environments and targets. Here on the left, in the, in the relatively easier um, sediment, very fine silt, we show the results of an 11 by 5.5 centimeter cylinder. So, so that's a 11 centimeters long, 5.5 centimeter diameter cylinder at a depth, burial depth of a meter. And we can see that the object stands out quite well against the background. So here, this is the sediment water interface, quite loud, but then against the weaker bottom, the target, this small target stands out well. Switching over to medium sand, the more challenging sediment, and using a much larger object, a two by one foot cylinder, buried at a meter depth, we can see the target here. If you take a slice through that target, it's a little hard to see on the slide here. If you take a slice through that target at the depth of the target, it stands out above the background by about 10 dB. So there's, there's enough excess there that it should be detectable. But we can see a lot more going on. We have quite a bit of multipath interference. And so I apologize, these arrows aren't in the right place. So this arrow should be here showing this multipath interference and this lower arrow here showing multipath interference. So this is multiple scattering. And this is one of the challenges that CERTIP identified for us as being a potential challenge in this very shallow water that we needed to address. And so, let's see, if we go to the next slide, we can see what's going on here. So the way this multiple scattering works is if you imagine the transmitter is firing and we wanted to say detect some object buried in the bottom here, 
the sound would travel from the transmitter to the object to the receiver. And that's the thing that we want to work with, the sound that goes straight from the transmitter to the object to the receiver. That's our signal. Multipath interference comes about due to other ray paths that come in at the same time. So for example, you could imagine that if sound leaks out of the back of my transmitter, it might hit the air-water interface, reflect off, travel back down to the seafloor, and then come back up to the receiver. And so we call that the SB multipath because it struck the surface, then the bottom. So SB, surface bottom. And so I call out these other multipath ray paths. There's SB, BS, BSB, and SBS are all ray paths up to second order that can interfere with the system. And those different ray paths come in at different times. So the water sediment interface, that shows up here. This SB or BS path is showing up here. And this BSB path shows up here. And you can see that if this target had been at this depth, it might have been masked by this multipath. It might have been challenging to see. And so our analysis through simulation really developed a design requirement for us that said, look, to mitigate multipath, we need at least 20 dB of passive rejection from the projector and receiver design. And so, okay, so what does that mean, 20 dB of passive rejection? It means that the sound that leaks out of the back of the transmitter should be one-tenth the amplitude or less of the sound that is sent out of the front of the transmitter. And the same on the receiver. Any echoes that bounce off the air-water interface and come in the back of the receiver, those echoes should be attenuated to be one-tenth or less of the amplitude of what comes in the front of the receiver. And so we'll see as we move into the, uh, as we move into the prototype demonstration piece how that design requirement actually influenced um, the design of one component of the sonar system. Okay, and with that, we're hitting the first uh, we're hitting the first Q and A session mark, and so I'll open the floor and and um, ask for uh, ask for questions from the moderator. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Um, and at this time, I would like to remind our audience to submit questions for Dan. And you can do that by using the chat box in the lower left-hand portion of your screen. And we have been receiving some questions as Dan has been presenting. Um, Dan, the first is um, the improvement of ISLR and resolution is shown versus depth. Is this improvement due to burial depth or to the range from the sonar? Or in other words, if the object was on the surface but the sonar was at a higher altitude, will you still see the multiple transmitter improvements? So that's that's actually a very good um, that's actually a very good question, and it's it actually is a, a somewhat nuanced and subtle answer. And so let me see here. I'm going to jump to a slide. So. One of the things that we run into with this sensor is that each one of these transmitters has a certain field of view. And as you get very close to the sonar system, so in the, in the near field of that transmitter ray, you can actually walk outside the field of view of, um, of, some, or, or of some of the projectors or some of the transmitters. And so that's the reason why we see this somewhat odd behavior for ISLR back in here. And the reason is at depths less than three meters, at ranges of less than three meters from the sonar, not all five transmitters are used. That complicates this ISLR analysis. At the end of the day, we achieve, um, we achieve an improvement in the performance of the sensor by merging multiple transmitters at all depths greater than one meter from the sensor. So once you're a meter away, we're starting to merge transmitters together and we're getting improvement. By the time you get to three meters away, we're merging all transmitters together and that's when you get the maximum improvement. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next question, can you speak more as to how the possum and tier models were combined and what were the challenges that were involved? Yeah, so, so the, the nice thing about linear acoustics is both of these models are generating um, pressure fields that we can just combine linearly with each other. So that's why we were able to separate the models 
and then add the data together um, at the back end. And that's, that's the combination procedure was just a straight addition of the two. The real challenge in doing that, though, came down to bookkeeping. Um, so, so what we had to do was, uh, in, in working with APL UW, we had to be very careful to make sure we were both simulating exactly the same geometry, um, exactly, the same, exactly the same signals, exactly the same sediments, exactly the same sensor, so that we could then just add the data together on the back end. So, so there was quite a bit of work in coming up with a framework to make sure we were simulating the same things. It's also part of what went on with those single point target tests. Because our model is fundamentally point based and, and the uh, tier model can also simulate points, we would both simulate the exact same thing, which is a single point at different positions, and then we compared the outputs of our simulations to make sure that we both generated, given the same configuration file, we could both generate the exact same data once we got that to that point and, and sorted out the bugs, that really gave us the kind of confidence that we could then later on merge their, their target results with our environmental results. So that, that's a good question, and that, that was a somewhat, somewhat uh, challenging portion of the program was, was sorting out all of our differences there. Okay. And how do you choose the separation between the five transmitters for optimal SAS processing? Uh, we, we, you, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, it's a balance between, so, so on the first question, I talked about the field of view of the transmitter. And so the further apart you put your transmitters, the, the, more, the, more you, the, the greater the range is before all five transmitters see a spot on the bottom. So, so there's, there's some design there, that there's some, some kind of cost benefit there that you got to think about. Um, and that's tied to the transmitter beam width. But from a, from, a, um, from a resolution standpoint, the further apart you put those transmitters, the higher the resolution you're going to get by merging them. So you want them to be very far apart. At, at the end of the day, it's a somewhat mundane, um, mundane answer, though, that's pragmatic. Um, the hole in our boat is from here to here, we put the transmitters as far apart as we could, right? So we, we, we weren't going to cut the boat. And so, so we looked at, hey, if we put them that far apart, what do we get? And we liked where it was at. And so, so that's how, in the end of the day, how that decision got made. Thank you, Dan. What is the rationale for the T-shape arrangement of the receiver elements? Um, yeah, that's, that's another good question, and, I, and, and it's also going to be a very pragmatic answer. There are supports here and here that are used to raise and lower the array. The actual array that we simulated was this portion in here, and then we added this forward part, and we added as much array as we could get given the constraints of our existing test platform. If you were starting from scratch, starting from a blank sheet of paper, and you could design any boat you wanted, you probably would not design this boat for this purpose. That, that being said, under this prototype demonstration for CERTUP, we wanted to leverage hardware that we had to the greatest extent possible. And one way to help keep costs down was the fact that we had this test asset with all of the data acquisition equipment available. So we just we used what was at hand um, in this effort. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan. And at this time, we'll move on to the second portion of Dan's presentation. Um, as a reminder, um, Dr. Van Brown will return at the end of the uh, webinar to, to address more questions. Um, so continue to provide your questions in the lower left-hand portion of your screen. Dan? Thanks a lot, Jennifer. All right, jumping into phase two, the exciting part where we get to talk about driving a pontoon boat around on a lake and collecting imagery of buried targets. So the modeling and simulation results that we talked about before kind of have informed our prototype sensor design. Um, as I said in answering the question, we had a significant leveraging of existing hardware for demonstration. And I think the, the drawing here really emphasizes the answer I gave to two of those questions. How do we decide how far apart to put these projectors 
and why is there a T-shape? You can see the kind of support hardware mounted here. The support craft or the surface craft that we're using lets us operate in water depths actually less than a meter, um, but we, we try to constrain ourselves to a meter or more of water, and we have a reconfigurable data acquisition system for experimentation. So we, we call the test platform the Sound Hunter. It's an 80-channel receiver. We have six channels of transmit. We have a COTS commercial high-frequency side scan. We use an RTK, real-time kinematic GPS, for absolute positioning. We have a fiber optic gyroscopic navigator, Nix Blue Fins. We have um, power is provided from a battery bank on the boat, so we have a DC to AC inverter, so we're not running any kind of generator while we're collecting data. We have an onboard water temperature sensor, 40 terabytes of data storage, and the option to propel the boat either by gas or electric propulsion. The projector and receiver design were critical to this, and this is where I emphasize the kind of design requirement that came out from our modeling and simulation of multipath analysis. Um, so on the left is a, is a uh, 10 to 30 kilohertz um, uh, beam pattern of our receiver. On the right is, uh, is a 10 to 40 kilohertz beam pattern of our projector. Um, and you can see in both cases that the front to back ratio, so the ratio of how sensitive the receiver is in the direction that you care about um, it being sensitive to the back side, in this case, is in excess of 25 dB, both for the projector and for the receiver. So this would be the front to back ratio. So it's really that design that helps us mitigate multipath interference. It gives us passive isolation against those first order multipath rays that we talked about. So that, that helps to clean up the imagery and, and make it usable. Another big part of our effort was in, in development of a test site. So we have the Foster Joseph Sayers Red, Reservoir nearby. It's about 40 minutes away from, from ARL. And in, in, in preparing that test site, it's a, it's a flood control lake near Howard, Pennsylvania. In the winter, they draw the lake down for uh, access, or they draw the lake down so that it can serve its flood control purpose. And what this gives us is in the fall and winter, when the reservoir is drained, we can actually get out on the lake bed along this normally submerged road here and access these places. And we've, we have our test site here, and we have another one that's kind of under this label here. So this is our shallow site and our deep site. And then in the summer and spring, the reservoir refills. You can see that on the right. And that allows us to then bring the, bring the pontoon boat back out, the Sound Hunter back out to collect data. Our early site characterization found about 10 centimeters of silt over a clay basement there. This is really an enabler for us. Um, Howard is close. It allows rapid prototyping. We can get out and test quickly. And the Winter Lake Drawdown gives us a really great opportunity to install targets with high fidelity ground truth. So this, is a, this shows the target installation and characterization. We have a digital elevation map that was collected during the, um, during the testing. So you can see with the lake bed drained, this is the profile in the, uh, in the test area. Also, as we buried the target, we can, see, uh, we can see a buried solid aluminum cylinder here in the middle plot. We can bury it, we can get the orientation and position um, and very good ground truth of exactly, exactly how this target is placed. We also have a number of clutter targets. Um, one of them is shown here, so this is, a, this is a rock that was buried. We also have position and depth of burial there. Um, the only downside to, uh, to this test site is um, the winter months when they drain the lake, are not the optimal time to take a team of guys out on the lake and dig holes as evidenced by the ice pockets that are formed all around this. So if, uh, if anyone's ever in the Penn State area and they feel like getting on the business end of a shovel and digging holes, where are your guys in, uh, in, the, middle of, in the middle of February? So the test site sediment characteristics, as I mentioned before, there was silt over a clay basement. It's really obvious when you dig your hole to see when you've passed between the silt and clay layer, and you can see it shown here. There's a, a very, very different um, sediment texture and color. Also, that uh, the silt is a biologically active area, so there's some midge flies that live in there, and you can see one of them called out by the arrow, and you can see a couple of their other 
little holes that they've generated. So we have a, a biologically active silt layer over, a, over our clay basement. We've collected sediment cores. We have one of them analyzed. Um, this core happened to be collected uh, not in an area where there was the silt clay transition. We've collected additional cores and we're working with um, the Naval Research Laboratory at Stennis to help characterize those. So we have the sand, the sediments, the three sediments at the top of the table here are those that were used in our model and SIM effort. And the bottom one is the measured or median values found in our core analysis. So our prototype integration and testing in the summer and fall of 2017, our hardware changes are that we, the, we expanded the receive array and reconfigured it. We uh, expanded our transmitter. We integrated the RTK GPS system. And we had multiple experiments that were then conducted at the test site. The, the early tests focused on debugging. And the proximity of this test site to our, to our lab is, is really an enabler. I think in the first two weeks of testing, we were out on the lake six or seven times. So as we'd identify a bug, we'd either work at it at the test site or, or, or trailer the boat back and, and work at it in the lab. Once we got through that kind of integration and debugging stage, the later tests really focused on surveying and imaging of deployed targets. And here, um, our largest survey date was November 8th of 2017, and that's, uh, that's a KML or a Google Earth view of our tracks. The white diamonds indicate the start of a track, and then the, the colored lines indicate the direction. And so you can see the shallow site on the left where we have multiple linear passes over our targets and the deep site on the right with multiple linear passes over the targets. And then a couple of or three transiting passes moving between, between the two sites. We also have a commercial side scan sonar. Um, it's actually a very inexpensive, inexpensive unit from a fish finder company. And we found that we can record that data and then pull it off and look at it. It, it just, it's not something we've really spent time in doing any type of detailed analysis, but it is nice to give yourself an overview of the area and what the kind of superficial clutter might be. In this case, there's a fish habitat. Um, the photograph of that fish habitat is shown on the right. So it's, it's almost like a, a set of pallets that are, that are bolted together or, or nailed together to form a place for fish to, to hide. And you can see it showing up in the imagery. It also gives the boat operator a real-time side scan display, so the boat operator has some context of, of where we're operating in the lake. Okay, so getting into the imagery now. So the sediment volume search sonar generates 3D sonar imagery. So we refer to that imagery as consisting of voxels instead of pixels because each, each um, atomic unit within the image represents a volume in space as opposed to an area. And there's a few different visualization techniques, right? So the challenge is how do you show someone 3D data, right? We, we're, all, we're all living in a 2D world in terms of our computers and our PowerPoints that we're generating. So we can use slices. We can take a 2D slice. We can use projections. Or we can use a 3D, 3D data viewer. So an example of a slice is, of three slices are shown here. In this example, in the top right, we can see our data cube. And if we think about going down at some depth into the sediment, right? So this is the depth axis. This is a long track. This is the direction that the boat travels. This is cross track. So this would be moving from left to right or port to starboard. So if we go at some depth here, almost think of it like taking a page out of the book or when you've seen a CAT scan and they can move the slices up and down through that volume of data they collect. So we're going to take a page out of the book or a slice out of the CAT scan, and that's this image here. And we can see we have a long linear object here. This is one of our large cylinders. Another slice that you could take is you could take a slice at a certain position and cross track. So you could index along here and slice in this direction, this light blue slice. That's shown here, and this is the same object. So there's the large cylinder here. Here's the large cylinder there. And then finally, the yellow slice that's shown, there's the large cylinder there. Right? So slices are one way to visualize the imagery. Now, the, the problem with slices is that you know, if your slice doesn't pass through the target, you're not going to see the target. Right? So, so for example, if there was a target down here in this bottom corner, None of my slices pass through it, so I might miss the target if I only looked at these slices. 
The advantages are it gives you a little bit of isolation, right? You're only going to compare the target to those pixels that are just around it. All right, so another way of viewing the data we call a MIP or a maximum intensity projection. Now, in this case, all of the data is considered in the visualization. In some sense, all of the data is considered in a visualization. So here in this case, imagine this column of voxels. And I'm going to say, all right, along this column, which voxel has the highest intensity, which is the maximum? And I'm going to write that out here. And then I move to the next column, and I search along, and I find the maximum, and I write that out here. Right? And so if I, if I proceed in that way, going along these kind of columns along the depth axis, and I keep projecting down, I form what we would call the depth MIP. I have projected along the depth axis, and I get a MIP whose axes are cross-tracked by a long track. And here we can see the solid aluminum cylinder, the long one. There's actually the short cylinders here, shot put here, and a shot put here. Again, we could do the same process, and we could project along this direction. And here's the cross-track MIP again, and we see our cylinders and shot puts all through here. And then the along track MIP is shown here. So in this cross-track MIP, here's the photographs of the five targets, and here's where they appear in the image. This guy is a little bit difficult to see. He's distorted because we actually started this data collect um, directly above him, so, so he gets a little distorted because of that. But then there's, the buried, there's a buried shot put, the short cylinder, the long cylinder, and another shot put. Now the piece that's really interesting here is that at each of these targets, we see this kind of time late structure. We believe that is elastic scattering off the targets. That is, the target, the acoustic wave has not just reflected off the target, but it is coupled onto the body and caused the target to re-radiate, and that re-radiation shows up as an extension in depth beneath. And we're very hopeful that those types of clues might be able to help us separate the man-made targets from, from those that aren't. And so an example of that is this very bright object here isn't showing any structure behind it. And we didn't plant that object. And so the thought is that some type of natural clutter. And if we look, when we went back out to the field using this depth slice, we're able to measure where the ends of this target are and say, OK, if I go down the track by so many centimeters, and I go, if I go down the track from this target by so many centimeters and over by so many, I should be over some object that's quite bright. Here you can see flags where we've gone back out to the field. We found the cylinder using a metal detector. We marked the ends of the cylinder here and here. And then we went down the track and over with another flag. And when we slid that flag into the bottom, we heard a click, and it was hitting this rock. We did the same procedure here on this short cylinder. We flagged the ends of it here and here and measured over and we found this rock. Both rocks were shown, or both rocks were found with their flat side facing upward. So this shows that we're able to resolve fairly small objects in the bottom, and potentially these kind of clutter objects that didn't show elastic scattering might be able to be differentiated from those man-made objects that were the targets of interest for us. So the next steps on the program or uh, in 2018 were to install an ordinance in the test area. Those photos uh, on the prior slide of me in the mud um, actually were taken during that 2018 install, and that was done in late March of this year. We included a range of burial depths in the target uh, in the shallow testing site, and we improved our sediment characterization. We've collected eight sediment cores uh, at, the, uh, at the test site, and we're wanting to further characterize our sensor performance. Okay, in conclusion, sediment volume search sonar program is a multi-phase effort to address shallow water burial ordinance problem. We began with a modeling and sim phase and followed that up with a prototype demonstration. And we believe through those two stages, we've demonstrated that this sensor has a capability for, uh, for target detection at fully buried target shapes. So some acknowledgments to make. Um, myself, I'm the, I'm the PI here at ARL, but my two co-PIs, uh, Sean Johnson and Cale Brownstead are instrumental in helping execute all of this. 
And then also Zach Lowe is our lead engineer. He's the main guy responsible for the uh, design and operation of the data acquisition system and much of the analog, uh, analog circuitry on our, on our test platform. At the Applied Physics Laboratory at the University of Washington, Aubrey Spagna and Steve Cargill worked on the tier model and really helped us substantially um, under the modeling and simulation effort. We, we couldn't have done it without their help. And finally, at the Naval Research Laboratory at Stennis, um, Joe Calantoni and Ed Braithwaite are working with us on the sediment characterization to help us understand the test environment that we're operating in. Okay, and with that, I think, uh, I think we can open up for Q&A session number two. Yes, excellent. Thank you, Dan. Our first question uh, for this Q&A session is from DOD. Have you worked with targets oriented vertically versus horizontally? We have not. All of the targets that we used in the, in the prototype stage uh, were oriented horizontally. In the targets that we installed in the test field in this March, we oriented one of our targets at 45 degrees, so nose up 45 degrees. But we don't have any targets that are oriented like perfectly vertically in the test field. Okay, thank you. What sort of existing ATR approaches do you envision being appropriate for the new data? Or will new approaches need to be developed to perform automatic detection and classification on these data? Oh boy, that's the right question. Um, th this is a hotly debated topic here. Th there, there, are several, there are several challenges, there are several challenges that we face. Um, one, we operate at, um, in order to get any appreciable, any appreciable penetration into the bottom, we operate at quite low frequencies, which can limit the resolution, which can limit the resolving ability of the sonar system. So, so we're never going to see, like, my background has come from some high frequency SAS imaging where we can get very fine resolution. I don't think we're ever going to get there. So the traditional image-based approaches are going to be difficult to use. Um, not that they can't be used, but, but they're going to be difficult to lean on exclusively. Obviously, we think we're seeing elastic scattering from the targets, and a number of people that have worked in this area are investigating this as well. That, that's obviously something that has to be investigated and has to be quantified. The challenge there is designing um, feature spaces or feature extraction techniques in order to extract meaningful and robust features from that. So, so I think that's an area of research and that, that's, a challenging, that's a challenging space. Um, the other challenge that we face, and, and this, is, this faces many sensors of this type, is just the limitations of the availability of training data, right? So we're in a data-starved environment. Many of the traditional machine learning algorithms um, that you see talked about in, in the popular literature today have very large training data sets, and we're never going to get there. So addressing the challenges of addressing the challenges of sparse data learning are going to be really critical, uh, really critical for this type of program as well. Okay, thank you. Can you say a little more about the single use transduce, transducers? Um, so maybe, see, I'm not sure I'm 100% on the question. It, it may be that they were asking about the signal use. So the signal, we used um, linearly frequency modulated chirps that were quite short, so sub-millisecond chirps that uh, in the imagery I showed here were 20 to 35 kilohertz. So we were up a little bit in frequency from our, from our notional design. Um, the transducers, if, if the question was really getting at like what transducer did you use, um, what was the design of the actual projector, it was an in-house design. So we have um, the, the group that I work in is a, uh, is a sonar system development group. We have the ability to fabricate transducers here, and it was a custom-designed projector that was used. So I hope, I'm not 100% on exactly what the question is, but I hope, I hope one of those two got it. Right, thank you. Another question from DOD. Would this approach work with UXO that is encrusted with coral? Um, you know, if, if, 
if the UXO is so encrusted with coral that the outside of the UXO, the outside of the object is indistinguishable from, let's say, a rock encrusted with coral, then image-based techniques are obviously going to be hampered by that type of presentation. Um, when the question was asked about what are the machine learning or ATR approaches that might be used, I posited that, that we have to identify um, feature extraction techniques or feature spaces that are robust. And I, I think this gets to what I mean by robust. So how robust can elastic features be to, um, to degradation of targets, right? So either encrusting or, or just the natural kind of, um, the natural kind of target, uh, um, uh, what's the word, I've lost it, but, but like the, the rusting and degradation that occurs over time. How, how, can we design, how can we design feature spaces that are robust to that? That's, that's definitely a future work question, and that's definitely, I think for everybody that operates in this, um, kind of in this domain, that's kind of in the forefront of their minds. Okay, thank you. Do you think the elastic scattering is more a function of the material properties, like metal versus non-metal, <clears throat> or the shape? cylindrical versus spherical versus plate-like? Oh, I, I think it's a tight combination of the two, right? So it's the, I think the elastic field that you're going to see is dependent upon both the material type and the shape, right? So I, that's why we, that's why we as researchers are, are, are focusing on this area is because it offers the promise of being potentially highly discriminatory. Um, it's the sensitivity is the is the open question, right? And 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 the robustness of the approach, right? Can you know think you know what's the joke, right? The the, the great thing is it's sensitive. The terrible thing is it's sensitive, right? So so is it? Can we identify ways in which it's sensitive, but in a robust framework that we can exploit? Um, so, but yes, I, I think I think the elastic scattering is is definitely due to both the properties and the shape. Okay. Um, and have you performed normalization in the MIPS to remove the brightness from the first bounce and multi-path in the depth yes. versus a long track image? Okay. Yeah, that, this is, yeah, that, so really good questions today. Um, yes, we have performed normalization. Um, it, is a, it is a heuristic data adaptive approach based upon median filtering in order to try and reduce the influence of that upper of that upper return. In fact, if you if you go back, um, let me see here, I'll go here. So in this image, we can see that the that the sediment water interface is quite bright here compared to the sub bottom. So in the simulation results, we did no normalization. In the MIPS that I'm showing, we you see that the data is doesn't have that effect present, and it's because the data has been normalized. This is a very active area of research for us right now, and in fact, in fact this is the problem I am looking at. Um, I'm trying to understand, are there, um, rather than doing heuristic data adaptive techniques, are there physically, physical acoustics um, principles that can be exploited particularly related to masking of Fresnel zones in order to reduce the reflected field, the influence of the reflected field. And I think that, um, I think that that's going to pay dividends. I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by initial results. So this, um, for interpretability of these sub-bottom images, in my estimation, um, understanding how to mitigate the very bright return from the air water or from the sediment water interface is definitely a, definitely a challenge. And we um, have time for two more questions today. The first question is, how accurately will the sensor be able to localize buried targets? Yeah, that's a great, that's a really great question too. Um, we have an RTK GPS system, so uh, unlike unlike existing platforms that might be submerged, um, like a UUV type platform that's going to require on a um, inertial sensor aided by a DVL or something of the like, 
Our sensor is on the air water interface, so we have GPS all the time, and we have a high we have a very high grade GPS that we're aiding with a real time kinematic sensor that's providing real time updates of the errors introduced by atmospheric effects to the GPS signals. If you believe the literature, this implies that we should be able to get absolute positioning sub five centimeter, um, potentially down to a centimeter. We have not proven that out yet. This is this is one of the one of the challenge topics we have this year is to understand that on resurvey, can we relocalize targets to to you know something less than a couple of inches? So our hope is that we're going to be able to get inside of five centimeters absolute positioning with the RTK aided GPS approach. Thank you, Dan. And the last question, um, what is the, the last message that you would like to leave our audience with today from your presentation? Yeah, um, this is a really interesting problem, right? And I think, the, I think the questions that were raised by, the questions that were raised today were the right kinds of questions too. You know, this, this problem um, that we're working on really sits at the intersection of a lot of different disciplines, right? So it's, it's a hardware design, it's a sonar modeling problem, it's a, it's a very challenging sonar signal processing problem, um, it's a challenging image processing problem, it's going to lead to a challenging, um, it's going to lead to some challenging machine learning problems. And I, I think that, that it's, it's by kind of holistically thinking about the whole system, Right, so, so trying to think all the way from the hardware design through the machine learning piece that we haven't gotten to yet, but how all those link together, I think those, it's going to be operating across the seams of those different domains that we really, really figure out how to crack this nut and how to, how to solve this problem. Um, yeah, so I, I guess, yeah, that would be my summary. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dan, for um, answering all of the questions and, of course, for the very informative presentation today. Oh, yeah, happy to do it. Thank you for moderating. Thanks. Um, and for the audience, a note, our next webinar is on September 6th, and it is about informing restoration programs for threatened and endangered plant species. And the webinar will feature a speaker from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and a speaker from California State Polytechnic University. Registration is open for this webinar and for the other upcoming webinars. So please visit the CERTUP and ESCCP webpage to register. Before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on the CERTUP ESCCP webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it if you could please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at this time. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you.
Thank you. Please stand by.